right. Welcome to the webinar. Is this a webinar or is this a master class? It's a master class, I think. It's more of a master class because there's what? a lot of information that we're going to be giving today. I got you. So what exactly is a master class, like by definition? I think my definition is <laughs> where you get a lot of information. Uh, you know, webinar is some where you get a bit of information and there's a lot of marketing and maybe, you know, a salesy pitch at the end of the webinar to sell something. But a master class is like pure value, pure content. And that's what we're well, going to be offering today. That's what we're shooting for. Yep. <laughs> we'll see if we succeed. All right. All of you that are watching, uh, post in the chat. Tell us where you're from. Margaret is from Down Under. I'm assuming Ooh. that's not Antarctica, right? <laughs> that's uh, got to be Australia. Hello, Margaret. Spencer's here. We see more people loading in right now. Wow. That's good. So what we're going to do is we're just going to hang out for the next couple minutes because um, a lot of times this software has a couple little, you know, like hangups, people coming in. There's old Molly. Molly, look forward to seeing you next week. In, or is it two weeks from now? Or is it next week? Next week in Vegas. That's going to be awesome. Um, but, yeah, we're just going to kind of hang out for a minute while everybody files in and gets in. And let me uh, give a little disclaimer. If something crazy happens, like if we disappear, if the sound cuts out, if like some technical difficulty happens, just hit the refresh button on your browser, and that usually fixes it. Uh, we use Webinar Jam because it's got some really powerful features like uh, with the, the presentation and all that stuff. But sometimes something wonky happens. So if that happens, no problem. Just hit the refresh button, go out, come back in. If you're watching and like your kid starts puking, you know, in the same room that you're at and you have to leave the webinar. I say that because I have three little kids and that seems like that's always happening. Uh, don't worry if you have to sign out, log out, uh, we will send everybody the replay. So tomorrow, I think I set it for 12 hours from now. So exactly 12 hours from now, uh, you all should be getting a email with the replay link and you can watch everything. So if you miss the last half, if you have to run out for some reason, whatever, crazy technical difficulty, it doesn't matter. You will get the replay. So we've had some more folks come in since I last said it. So while you're coming in, post in the chat where you're from. Let's see. Um, Brian Acrowdy? A what is Brian talking about? I don't even know what that means. A crowdy? Is that a city? Tom, Tom Norton's busted in. I suspect that his wife Cindy's watching. Old Pete from Gold Coast. Wow, we got people from all over the place. This is kind of cool. Old Spence is in Phoenix where it's not cool right now. Tiffany, who identifies with Fort Worth, Texas, which is unique because most people just say Dallas, but she must be proud of her Fort Worth um, residency because most people don't even say that. Ah, yes, Brian, Akron, Ohio. I had my best friend in high school played college football in Akron, and he was not a big fan. I don't know if it was a school or the city, but he wasn't. Oh, Kimberly, <laughs> she's coming to China with us next month. That's exciting. Out there in Redondo, um, Barbados. That is awesome. So we have definitely international people. Chris, that is so cool that you're here. I don't know that we've ever had anybody from Barbados in one of our webinars before. It's a first. I'm going to check that off the list. Yes, bucket list. we got a lot more to tack off, though. Megla's technically in Singapore. So do I get yes. to mark off Singapore? You will. I think, <laughs> I, think I get to mark that off. Barbados and Singapore now. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. We've had a few more people come in. So um, we'll give it like another minute and a half, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, at least in, before we start the content, but I want to introduce Megla. Megla has uh, been a joy to meet and get to interact with in this e-commerce slash Amazon slash sourcing world that I live in. Um, I feel bad. I've let her down before. And <laughs> when I let her down, I was sitting on my couch like six hours after having surgery for these kidney stones that they had to surgically remove. And I texted her, I said, Megla, I'm supposed to be on a plane tomorrow morning for Hong Kong to come speak at your conference and I can't make it. And I'm so sorry. She said, Tim, you just had surgery today. Why on earth did you get on an airplane? So I feel like um, Megla has been polite enough and kind enough to forgive me for, it was like basically a 48 hour notice that I wasn't coming to this conference. So that pretty much allows us to be best friends, right? I mean, if we could recover from that type of terrible <laughs> diss to your whole organization, that's great. So, um, Megla, why don't you give like the 20-second the 
well, it's going to be more than that. The minute and 20 second background on where you're from, what you've done, kind of all your history and how that leads you to being able to present on sourcing in India now. Yeah, sure, Tim. So I've been in the sourcing industry for a very long time, almost 20 years, two decades. Well, I'm old. <laughs> um, so I worked in India and then I was based in the Philippines for a few years and then I lived in China for about 10 years and then I've been in Singapore for about four years now. So I've mostly worked with global sources which uh, I think most people are familiar with Global Sources. It's a B2B sourcing platform. And while working for Global Sources, I did a lot of um, uh, research reports. So I visited a lot of factories in China and in India to write these 100-page research reports on how products are manufactured in China. And that's what really allowed me to get a close look at how production happens in Asia and you know what are the issues that people face and... Um, you know, what are the things that importers and, and buyers who are sourcing these products really care about? Um, what affects quality and price? And so, you know, that's how I really got an understanding of manufacturing and exports. And then about three years ago, I started producing this conference for Global Sources uh, called Global Sources Summit in Hong Kong. Uh, this is an e-commerce sellers conference uh, for global e-commerce sellers who are looking to source private label products from India and China. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's how I got involved in the e-commerce industry and, you know, started working with cool people like you. And here I am now. <laughs> Recently, so, I started my own venture. <laughs> nice. So you left the corporate world. That's scary, but wonderful. So it's very scary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's important to note, all of you that are listening and, you know, I get to meet a lot of people and there's a lot of people that, um, are very well spoken with very poor experience. There's a lot of people with great experience but have a hard time teaching and explaining that wisdom and the knowledge that they have. And Megla is like the perfect combination of everything. Um, 20 years in sourcing, she's been to countless countries. Uh, she's been to multiple factories. She knows how to manage expectations. She knows how to identify good work versus bad work. But also, she is so tightly tied into the e-commerce space. She knows a lot of us. She knows a lot of the industry. She knows a lot of the pain points. And um, she hasn't said this in these terms, so I'm going to be a little bit um, assumptive here. But when she decided that she was going to leave her corporate job and she wanted to stay in this realm that she was familiar with, she wanted to focus very heavily on India. And I think that's very telling. I think that there's a reason for that. Now, I will say this. I am not condemning anything. I'm not condemning China. I'm not condemning you know other uh, places. I'm not condemning Central America, nothing. I just feel that there are a lot of opportunities out there. By understanding more opportunities, it gives you a better chance of success. Now, personally, over at Hickory Flats, we are, uh, which is the company, it's a private label legion group. We're sourcing uh, products from a lot of places. We've got containers on the water right now coming from China, and that won't stop. We've still got products coming from Central America, and that won't stop. But there are some products that we had a really hard time sourcing from different places like China. Like maybe their price and their quality was great, but their MOQs were huge. There were some things that were beautiful made in Central America or Haiti, but we needed to reduce the price to be competitive on market places like Amazon. In India, for some products, this turned out to be a really, really good option. So we are currently personally sourcing I don't know, probably a dozen products from India, and they're all custom made uh, per our specs. They're great. We've got together all of the uh, logistics and the resources and the people in place to make that happen. So uh, I will say it's a far cry from where we were at maybe four or five years ago when I first tried to source in India, and it was a debacle. It was a nightmare, and it's because I didn't know the right people. So knowing the right people like India, and I've already gone through the slide presentation she's got for you guys. She literally gives you the contact information of good resources there. Like she literally saying, hey, here's people to contact. We've got no skin in the game. We're not getting affiliate commissions on that, nothing. We are literally just trying to give you as much good information as we humanly can. So uh, Megla has, is she's way more organized than I am, and she brags about that and tries to make me feel bad about that all the time. <laughs> so she has this great, wonderful slide presentation, and I'm going to let her start working through that, and then I'm basically just going to interject and carry on some uh, some comments and maybe some questions as she goes. And then those of you that are watching, post questions or comments in the chat. As Megla's trucking along, I'm going to keep an eye on the chat box, and anything that you have, we will address as we go. 
And then towards the end of this thing, as we kind of wrap things up, we'll have more time for questions. So there's a lot of content here. This is like some of the best information out there. I've read Megla's uh, free ebook, and I think there's a link to that at the end of the slides that you guys all need to download. Really great wealth of information. So, uh, Megla, I guess go ahead and take it away, and I'm just going to interrupt you whenever I feel like it. Sure, absolutely. Okay, let's start. So, just go. Okay, so um, here are the topics that we're going to be covering over the next half hour or so. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about why you should source from India, um, some of the differences between sourcing from India and China, what are the specific types of products that you can source from India, because not everything is available in India. I'm going to be sharing a few tips for effective sourcing, and then I'm going to tell you how to how you can start sourcing from India. And I've also got um, a few service providers that you can contact immediately to to start looking for products. And then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about this India sourcing trip that I'm organizing in October of this year. And then, as Tim mentioned, we have some time for Q and A. Okay. I'll I think I've already gone over this. I'm not going to do this again, but you know, I've uh, sourcing is my thing. Basically, I've been working in the sourcing industry for a long time. I presented at a lot of different uh, conferences and attended, you know, tens of trade shows over the years. Um, now, did you say okay. did you say tons or tens? Tens. <laughs> tens of trade shows. Hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> Okay, so why source from India? Why should e-commerce sellers consider sourcing from India? I think one of the key reasons you should look at India is there are a lot of unique products available from India that are not available in other countries. A lot of the products are handcrafted and high-end, and they're very attractive and eye-catching, which is actually great for e-commerce because um, you know when you have a consumer searching or uh, scrolling through search results on, on Amazon on their phone, and uh, you know they're scrolling through search results, and they see this product that's really eye-catching. Um, it catches their attention, and and they tend to you know stop. I call these products thumb-stopping. So you'll find a lot of these products, you know, that are very colorful and attractive, and they're great for e-commerce. There are a lot of local indigenous styles uh, that are not found in other countries. For example, there are a lot of different types of fabrics that you'll find all across the country. Um, that are very special and unique to India. They're, you know, embroidered and embellished kind of fabric. Similarly for metal handicrafts, for example, there are a lot of local designs that you won't find in other countries as well. Um, some of these products can command higher prices because they are handmade. They tend to be, you know, higher quality. And uh, for similar products from China that are mass produced, these products can command higher prices. Um, also for most products that you source from India, you would probably not sell them in the millions, like you know maybe power banks or uh, silicone spatulas, for example, that you source from China. Those products are typically very high volume, low profit kind of products. But when you source from India, I mean most product categories would be um, slightly higher price. They'd be ha they'd have higher profit margins, and you'd be selling smaller volumes. But the advantage of this approach is that you'll stay under the radar of, you know, a lot of the Chinese sellers who are targeting these highly competitive, high profit categories. So I think this one of the strategies when you're sourcing from India could be to have um, a number of SKUs, maybe, you know, 10, 12 SKUs, but you're selling smaller volumes for each of those SKUs and they are, each of them is, um, you know, potentially higher, uh, giving you higher profits. Megla, I feel like you have just, go back to that one. Go back one slide okay. if you would. I feel like you yeah. have just given the entire game plan for our business model. This is perfect. Oh my god! Uh, we don't love cheap. We don't love you know super high volume with low profit. That's so important. I love the higher prices. And the truth is, with just an Amazon US, you know the 280 million users, there's enough people looking for higher end products. And I would say that that number of people is growing because people are sick of just cheap bullcrap stuff. Like they want nicer items right so having something that's a little bit more eye-catching more appealing is awesome and I love that um, uh, you know what you're saying we fly under the radar not just of black hatters but also of just competitors when people see yeah. us selling huge numbers of something they get excited and they think they can compete with us when we instead do the same volume but over three or four or five or six SKUs, that really sets us up for a lot more stability and security it's super important now another thing I want to say is these handcrafted high-end products, you know, these are not, like she said, power banks and silicone spatulas. It doesn't mean they can't be produced in high volume. 
A lot of people yeah. think there's this correlation between handcrafted and, oh, I can't get them. That's not true. Our experience in India has been that it's a great solution for handcrafted items that we need a much higher volume than, say, we can get in Central America. This seems to be a really good solution for us. So I just wanted to kind of clarify that a little bit. So, all right, continue. I'll interrupt you <laughs> okay. 72 more times. <laughs> That's totally fine. <laughs> Another advantage I see is uh, low MOQs, which is really advantageous for e-commerce sellers when you're either starting out or you just want to test a product category. A lot of the handmade items, you know, they're, they have flexible production uh, facilities and um, uh, they can accommodate lower MOQs, whereas for you know, mass produced items, it's it's uh, usually difficult for Chinese suppliers to adjust their production facilities and it's not really economical for them to produce in lower volumes. Uh, typically, you know, the MLQs in India would be around 200 to 500 pieces, um, specifically for handmade products. I mean, for textiles and garments, they may be higher, um, but you can order as few as 50 pieces, you know, for a trial order. The pr prices might be slightly higher, but, um, you know, most suppliers are very accommodating when it comes to MOQs. And that's so important, again, to the methods that we use because we love testing stuff. And, you know, it, it's it's hard to swallow the idea of buying literally 2,000 of something when instead we can get 200 to 500 to start or, you know, 50 to test. That's so important. Correct. Absolutely. Another advantage is that, India is a huge country and there are a lot of local raw materials available which makes prices of products made from these raw materials very competitive. So for example, cotton, silk, jute, marble, metal, wood, bamboo, leather, all of these products are locally available. Whereas in some other countries, you know, alternative markets like Vietnam, Indonesia, um, many of these materials have to be imported from China and that increases the overall production. But India has local production of these uh, raw materials. In fact, India is the second largest producer of cotton in the world. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, products made from these ma natural materials are more competitive. India is better with uh, products made from natural materials, whereas China is better for products made from man-made uh, materials, such as, you know, silicon or plastic and uh, injection molded kind of items. And what's interesting is this list looks small. I'm going to keep hitting the back button. Um, yeah. The list looks small. <laughs> so let me go to my whiteboard thing. What do we got here? We've got, I was just playing with this right before this call. So y'all bear with me. But we've got just in this section, how many items? One, two, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's a lot of people that see that and go, oh, man, only eight different materials. Like, there there can't be that many things. Folks, I'm looking at these eight different materials, and those constitute millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of products. Do not be scared seeing this and thinking, oh, there's not a whole lot that can do. Now, what I don't see here is, like, plastic, and I don't see... You know, like CNC um, metal. The metal that that you're going to find in India is more uh, rustic, more handcrafted. It's not going to be like heavily machined parts, even though you can get that. But these items right here are exactly what we're having a lot of success for. Just leather alone, just that one right there. I mean, that could be tens of thousands of different products. You can even go on to like Amazon, find what's selling well in a PU leather. So find leather items that are selling extremely well in PU, uh, which is the fake leather, you know, pleather, and buy one. And let's send it to China and get it reverse engineered, you know, based on the reviews and, you know, if everybody likes that style. And I would venture to say that you can nearly get the same type of product or the exact same product in real leather that you could in PU leather from China with a lower MOQ and you can double those price points. So that's super, 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 super important to be thinking about is don't be discouraged by that lowish number of materials that they excel in. You know, there, there are lots of other products you can get made in India, but that list constitutes a ton of opportunity. Correct. Another advantage I see is that um, typically Indian suppliers have a bit more respect for IP than Chinese suppliers. Um, and I think one of the reasons is because they themselves, I mean, invest a lot in R&D and design development. And it's also the culture, I think, uh, you know, and the democratic nature of society. Um, whereas in China, it's, um, you know, it's more socialist and, you know, they think everything is like up for grabs. Um, but I feel that if you 
if you have your own designs in India, they're they're less likely to be copied by your supplier or um, and in fact, a lot of suppliers don't sell directly on Amazon yet. So, you know, you, you'd have uh, your supplier won't be your competition on Amazon, which is very likely to happen in China. So I think this is one advantage. In fact, when I was at the trade fair in uh, in Delhi earlier this year, um, a lot of the exhibitors there wouldn't let me take photos of their products because they're very productive, protective of their designs. So I think this is one advantage as well. You know, your IPs yeah. would be safer. Yes, absolutely. Um, another advantage I see is um, most of the suppliers would be English speaking and most people in India, you know, speak English. There are about 22 official languages in India and each state has its own different language with a different script. So I'm from north of India and when I go to the south, uh, when I go to the southern states, it's difficult for me to understand their language. So we communicate in English. English is the second official language in India and it basically helps Indians communicate with each other. So, um, you know, you don't need translators when you go to visit trade shows or your suppliers and your contracts can all be in English. I think that's one advantage. Um, not to say that this is a hindrance in China. You know, can, there are a lot of people who speak English and everything, but it's just smoother when you source in India and when you, when you, when you communicate with your, with a supplier, um, you know, who speaks, um, English well enough. Yeah. Another advantage is uh, there's no tariff on India made products just yet. <laughs> Who knows what will happen in the future? But, you know, as of now, um, there are no tariffs. So if your product is hit by tariffs, um, you could consider sourcing, you know, uh, from India. You could consider looking for those products uh, in India. So that's one advantage. There is some trade tension between the U.S. and India, but as of now, it should not affect e-commerce seller uh, product categories. It's mostly for, um, you know, things like raw materials and food stuff and machinery and motorcycles <laughs> and all that stuff. So I think our categories are safe for now, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Did you have anything else to add over here, Tim, before we go to the next section? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think you're you're covering it well. Tom Norton okay, says cool. this is awesome. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, now so let me let me pause for one second. Badra, dude, good to see you again. Badra is asking, are there any restrictions of material to U.S. from India? I think you just addressed that. There's really nothing. And Tom's asking the same thing: anti-dumping laws for wood products. I'm not aware of anything like that. I'm not aware of any restricted items that are unusual to India. You know, of course, wood items, you have to have your Lacey Act. You have to have your fumigation, um, yeah. you know, just the normal stuff from every country. And I'm not aware at all of any anti-dumping laws um, of any product coming to China or coming to to the U.S. from India, except for a couple of things that Megla just mentioned, which are very heavily industrialized items, like maybe some automotive parts. So... I, I I haven't found anything, anything at all like that. Yeah, same here. I mean, I, I haven't seen any anti-dumping duties on any of the products. Um, yeah, not aware of anything. Mm -mm. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the differences between India and China. So, you know, as Tim mentioned at the beginning, it's not like India is going to replace China. China is still the main manufacturing hub for most product categories, but it's a good business strategy to diversify your sourcing markets, not to put all your eggs in one basket. I think that's what you're doing when you're looking for alternative markets. So uh, you would have, you know, what I what I call a China plus one or a China plus two strategy. I think that should be your sourcing strategy. So you're sourcing some products from China and then you're also looking for alternative markets, you know, like India, Vietnam, Indonesia. And uh, you're just kind of spreading your risk a little bit and diversifying your sourcing. So that's the strategy um, that I think most sellers should have moving forward. Okay, so what are the key differences? You know, in China, of course, there's a lot of automated large scale production and high volume production. You'll find less of that in India, specifically for products that are uh, that e-commerce sellers are going to source. There are a lot of large scale factories for, you know, things like um, automotive parts, for example, cars. Um, you know, machinery, uh, things like electrical pumps and, and agricultural equipment, for example. Um, but for the products that e-commerce sellers would source, most of the um, factories would be smaller scale, maybe about 100 
250 workers. Um, th most of the processes, processes would be done manually. There would be some machines involved, but, you know, a lot of the processes would be done manually. Um, yeah, and then, as I mentioned earlier, there's more respect for IP in India, uh, whereas in China it's, um, you know, less so. Uh, one of the disadvantages of sourcing from India is that there are fewer product categories, whereas you can source anything and everything in China, you know, from a needle to an aircraft. But in, in India, there are certain product categories that are more competitive. Um, also, for India, there's not much information available online. Um, whereas for China, there are so many blogs and YouTube channels and experts and you know so many sourcing trips to China. So it's easy to access all of the information. It's easy to import from China, whereas it's a lot more harder to do that from India. The barrier to entry is higher. But I see that as an advantage for people who are willing to uh, spend the time and effort to, uh, you know, get all of this information, to go to India and to look for all of these products and suppliers. Because, um, uh, you know, most other people don't have access to these products. So if you if you can, um, you know, get to all of this information first, I think you'd be at an advantage. A um, couple more differences. So in India, the logistics service providers are currently not very familiar with FBA requirements. Whereas in China, you know, there are so many service providers um, that are familiar with FBA. And in fact, in most cases, your supplier will just manage the shipment for you and they'll do DDP. Whereas in India, you know, you'd have to, first of all, work with a separate freight forwarder. The supplier will not manage your shipments. And even the freight forwarders, you know, not all of them are familiar with FBA requirements. Um, you'd have to be a li little more careful in choosing a freight forwarder and, and other service providers. Um, and you'd have to make sure that they're familiar with FBA requirements. I think China is where, uh, sorry, India is where China used to be maybe three or four years ago when uh, Amazon FBA sellers were just starting to source from China. And at that time too, you know, a lot of the Chinese suppliers were not familiar with uh, all of these requirements. But as more e-commerce sellers started sourcing from India, you know, their their uh, their expertise was improved. And now, of course, there are so many service providers that cater specifically to Amazon sellers. So the same thing is going to happen in India over the next few years. But right now, they're just starting out. Yeah, Another it's kind of like you'd the find Wild West that... right now. Like, you get in right now <laughs> yeah. and figure this out. This is like China was 10 years ago. <clears throat> exactly. Another thing you'd find is that the infrastructure is not as developed as it is in China. You know, little things like roads and ports. Uh, in China, all of these things are very efficient. But in India, they're still a bit, um, uh, you know, they're not at advanced. But India is kind of focusing on all of these things a little bit. But things move very slowly in India. And um, I, I have seen improvements over the last few years, but they still have a long way to go. And there are little things that, you know, Im impact your uh, production and delivery times. For example, um, during the monsoon season or the rainy season in July and August, um, some of the roads are really flooded in, in key cities like Mumbai. Mumbai is one of the major ports where, um, you know, products are mostly shipped from. And so the roads and all are really flooded. And sometimes the city comes to a standstill for a couple of days and trains are delayed and, you know, flights are delayed and, and um, the whole, um, you know, logistics and all is really impacted during that time. So uh, there are things like this that may affect production and you have to just be aware of this and, and plan around these, um, you know, these events. Um, another difference you'll find is that labor costs are still lower in India, whereas in China, uh, labor costs are increasing are higher and they are increasing, especially in cities like Shenzhen and Guangzhou that are the main production hubs. Um, labor costs have been rising. And in fact, this is one reason why a lot of the larger retailers and, uh, and importers have been looking at alternative markets, you know, over the last five, six years or so. For example, a lot of the low end garment production has already moved out of China. It's gone to Bangladesh and Vietnam, Indonesia and India. So one of the reasons for that is the increasing uh, production costs, you know, in, in China. It's got nothing to do with tariffs or anything. It's just that China is developing and, uh, you know, um, just just salaries are increasing. Another difference that you'll find is that uh, both countries have very large domestic markets. 
they have uh, populations of over 1 billion. <laughs> but, um, um, and both markets are not very easy to sell into, but I think India is relatively easier to sell into. So if you want to start selling on Amazon India, for example, um, there is a very long and elaborated, you know, process that you have to go through because you have to set up a company in India to be able to sell directly on Amazon and you have to have a local director in that company. So it's a long drawn process and sometimes with bureaucracy and all, it can take like a month or two to set up a company and start selling. But once you do that, it's a really fast growing market nowadays. There's a very um, uh, large middle class and um, you'll also find that this, uh, you know, the middle class actually, they like products that are imported. And so I was listening to, um, you know, a podcast recently from somebody in Australia who has started selling on Amazon India. And guess what products they're selling on Amazon India? Australian made products. They are very popular in India. So I think that's an opportunity for, you know, people who are maybe, who've got some products that are made in, um, you know, made in the US or, or Europe or elsewhere, you can tap into the domestic market in India. And Amazon is spending a lot of money now trying to expand that market. And it's going to explode in the next couple of uh, years. I'm pretty sure of that. China is also a huge market, but it's more difficult to sell because, uh, I mean, the language is a barrier, of course. Um, but again, um, you know, of course, there's no Amazon in China. You can't sell via Amazon. You have to go to go go via, you know, Tmall or Taobao, Taobao or one of the yeah. other Chinese channels. Yeah. So let me let me kind of voice some of the takeaways I get from this. One is, um, well done, Megla, and I'll say that to pat you on the back because, <laughs> you know, you're focusing on sourcing in India, and you are so convinced that. Giving everybody good knowledge and information is more valuable than sugarcoating things, right? Like you're literally telling the truth. Hey, logistics and service providers are a little bit harder to find. They're tougher to deal with. There's going to be some issues like the monsoon season, which I think China, you know, the worst is Chinese New Year. So there's probably a, ba a yeah. balance there. <laughs> um, but I want to say this. Uh, to everybody that's listening, just because it's more difficult doesn't mean it's worse. I actually prefer it because these difficulties like that I found five or, or four or five years ago when I was trying to source from India, those deterred me from doing it. Now, since I have the right contacts and I'm going um, on uh, Megla's trip in October to hopefully gain even more contacts than I already have, but what, since I found those, it made everything possible. So I don't have to worry about the freight forwarding issue. I don't have to worry about the FBA requirements because if you do find the people that can help you with that, you don't have any problems. But since it is tougher to find that organically or just Googling, it means that there's going to be less competition doing this, which is super, super important. Now, before we move on, we had a few questions. Peter was saying, even though I'm not in the U.S. myself, didn't Trump impose some tariffs from stuff India exports to the U.S.? And while Megla was speaking, I just went and double-checked my facts on that. Yeah, there were a few things like um, motorcycles, automotive parts, a uh, few yeah. things, and that was in retaliation to the import duties that India pushed on, like, apples and almonds coming into <laughs> India from the U.S. So it doesn't really affect us. It's an extremely small scale, and India and the U.S. are huge allies. They're not having a trade war like... U.S. and China, not a big deal. Um, Correct. And what happened was that there was this trade deal that was signed uh, between the U.S. and developing countries in 1975, where um, literally 1975, <laughs> where certain product categories were given preferential access into the U.S. So they were um, you could um, import those products without any duties from India and certain other developing countries. So what the U.S. has done now is that the U.S. has excluded India from that list of preferential countries. And then in retaliation, India imposed some uh, tariffs on almonds and apples and all of that. And then in retaliation, <laughs> the U.S. imposed some duties on, you know, motorcycles or stuff like that. So that's what's been going on. <laughs> so long story short, not a big deal. We all know that media yeah. pumps stuff up to make it seem worse than it is. It's not really hurting us. Keith Crow said, exactly. I'm glad my flight to San Diego got canceled. Keith, I can't believe that you're going to miss Comic-Con. That's your jam, and I feel for you, but I'm glad you could be here. Um, Keith says he's all in for a sourcing trip to India. Come on, buddy. Let's go. Uh, I, Keith and I have been meaning to get together for lunch for like three months, so instead we'll just have lunch in India. Um, Alejandro asks a great question. He says, uh, do these factories produce their own products, or 
can I also share my actual handmade designs and get them produced there? Yes and yes. Yes. That is, yeah. uh, I don't know anywhere that uh, produces items that won't take your specific product and manufacture it for your specs. And, you know, India is developed enough, more so than a lot of like third world countries, where a lot of these manufacturers have their own R&D departments. They have their own designers. Yeah. They're making stuff. And in October, um, Megla is going to be walking me through the Delhi Fair, which is uh, basically the showcase for all of these manufacturers that source their own products. So, yes, you can definitely go get both. I see Chris had to run off with the kids, uh, catch a replay tomorrow. <laughs> Tom, you're right, lower competition, that barrier to entry, lower competition. Peter uh, was saying it looks like it might be tough to sell in India. So that's not, you know, a big focus of – or I don't believe that should be a focus of what Amazon sellers are doing right now is selling in India. Yeah. But I think that it's extremely easy to um, keep that on the back burner as potential uh, partnership opportunities. And what I mean Correct. by that is when you start talking to people to source products, big things happen. My first business partner in China, like literally had her own business in Shanghai or Hong Kong first and then Shanghai. He was a supplier and just gaining that relationship and talking to him, he said, Hey, let's partner up on stuff. And, um, I suspect that, you know, all of us who have had some, you know, moderate to, to good business success can attribute a lot of that to the network and to the uh, community that we have and the people that we know. You know, every hand you shake could be the next million dollar handshake, right? Um, so I think that long term, there is a lot of opportunities to find these strategic partners that can handle all of the, you know, tough aspects of selling in India for us and kind of reverse this flow too. So definitely not something we're focusing on, but keep it in the back burner because that may turn into be an opportunity once you start dealing with other people in India. Exactly. And one of the options is to, I mean, if you want to explore the market, you know, if you have a really good brand that you think might be appealing to the Indian consumers, um, you could look for a distributor. So there are actually Amazon sellers that have their own accounts uh, that would be willing to distribute your products. So you don't have to go all out and start your own company. You know, um, you can just start small. Okay, so this is a chart that, um, a table that I thought was very interesting. And I got this from Gary Huang, who's also basically a China sourcing guy. And uh, he had written an article about alternative markets, and he had got this uh, comparison table from one of the people that he had interviewed for, for his article. And so this particular buyer, they, they saw um, a decrease of 37% or the production costs were 37% lower in India than they were in China. And this is for bags. They were manufacturing uh, leather bags, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, yeah, I mean, overall, you know, for some product categories where India is competitive, your production costs can be lower than China. And, you know, with the tariffs and everything uh, in the mix, um, it can be very competitive, you know, for certain product categories. Okay, so let's look at the products that you can source from India. And, um, you know, these are some of the very high-level product categories. There are, of course, thousands of products within each of these categories, but at a very high level, home decor and gifts. This is one of the biggest categories that you'll find in India and also at the trade show that we're attending in Delhi. So, um, you know, again, products made from metal, wood, ceramic, jute, gl cotton, glass. And these are things like, um, you know, home decor items like... Um, I don't know, candle stands and photo frames and, uh, you know, all of the different home decor items, anything that you can think of, lanterns, um, Christmas decorations. Then you'd also find a lot of home kitchen and tableware. So, for example, cutlery, um, serving spoons, bowls, pots and pans. There's, there's a lot of stainless steel uh, production also done in India for, um, you know, kitchenware. In fact, India is a very big consumer of stainless steel products um, for, you know, like cooking pots and pans and even plates and all and, and bowls. Um, India uses a lot of uh, stainless steel kitchenware. So that's a, a good product over there. And then uh, furniture, furnishings and made up. So like cushion covers and rugs. I saw a huge variety of rugs at the trade show that I thought were very interesting, you know, cotton and jute and uh, rugs made from different materials. And now rugs, you would think that, you know, oh, this is a very bulky item and it's it's a large size item and maybe it won't be profitable if you sell it on Amazon. But the thing is that for these kinds of items, you know, the prices are higher and you do have the margin to accommodate the higher storage fees and all that Amazon has. So I would not rule out these products. I know that a lot of people out there, you know, they say that only sell small products on Amazon and should fit in a shoe box and all those things. But I think that um, you should ex explore other 
products as well that are bulkier, that are heavier, because, you know, one, not many people are doing those products. So again, you're, there's less competition there. And these products are potentially, uh, you know, high, they have higher profit margins. So I don't know what your thoughts are, Tim, on, uh, you know, sourcing products that are bulkier and bigger. Yeah, we sell uh, a fair amount of oversized items. Again, barrier to entry uh, is higher, yeah. so less people think to do it, less competition, but it works. Okay, cool. And then you also find a lot of fashion products, so jewelry, apparel, accessories such as scarves, shawls, um, footwear, uh, specifically, you know, leather footwear or even very unique footwear made from um, jute or different types of grasses, beachwear. Textiles and apparel, cotton, denim, silk, and wool. A lot of denim also, like jeans and jackets. Um, there are, you know, cashmere or pashmina is a very high-end material um, that is used to make shawls and scarves. So you'll find a lot of that in India as well. Then, of course, leather, genuine leather. Most of the leather in India you'll find is, I mean, the leather products are handcrafted. Uh, so there are things like bags, wallets, belts, you know, fashion accessories. And then you'll also find things like equestrian products. So saddles, uh, dog leashes and, uh, you know, those kinds of things as well. Sports equipment. So there's things like cricket, tennis, football. You won't find things like uh, golf clubs because, again, those are very, you know, machined um, products. But you'll find cricket bats that are made of wood, <laughs> you know, footballs, leather those kinds of things. Eco-friendly products. I think this is a huge product category. And uh, so you, again, I mean, jute, rattan, grass, those are eco-friendly products. But you'll also find that there are companies in India that are uh, doing a lot of research and producing biodegradable products. So there's this one company that I came across recently. They are producing biodegradable tableware made out of sugarcane um, something, sugarcane waste. So that is very interesting, you know, that uh, it's, it's really good for the planet, of course. Um, you don't have to use, you know, styrofoam or all of those packing um, uh, tableware. So it's a, it's a very good eco-friendly alternative. And this factory specifically is actually producing these products at a very high scale. So they have a capacity of one million pieces per day. And they are increasing that capacity significantly. Yeah, and in case someone is, is interested in this product, I've actually posted it in, in the group that I have, uh, you know, on India Sourcing. And I'm trying to get someone from that company to do a webinar in the group because I think there's huge potential and there's a lot of interest in these kinds of products. There's another a similar product that's made from some sort of leaves. Um, again, very eco-friendly and great for disposable um, plates and, you know, party wear, things like that. Uh, party items. And if you're adventurous, you can also try food. So there's a different variety of tea, coffee, spices, uh, rice, lentils, beans, you know, all of those things. Um, in fact, somebody from Australia, um, Sophie Howard, who's actually, he, who sources from India, and uh, she's got like, I think a six, seven figure business sourcing from India and Vietnam and alternative markets. She does tea. And uh, she, in fact, uh, makes her own tea, own tea blend. So in India, you'll find a wide variety of tea available. There's black tea and green tea and, and all of those things. So good variety. Okay, fabrics of India. So um, this is, uh, you know, just to illustrate the, the designs and the variety of fabrics and textiles that are found in India. So each state has its own unique style. And I think there's a lot of uh, possibility. I don't think you can read much over here on this slide, but <laughs> they're all different styles. It's a, of it's a good, uh, good example of how many different things. Um, Stephen's asked a couple questions about lead time. I'm trying to get to these questions as we go along. Stephen's asking yeah. a couple questions about lead times on shipping from India to the U.S. via sea. It's, yeah, I, so it's about the same yeah, um, 20, as China. It's about 20 to 35 20 days. days, something like that. And then air yeah. rates, air rates, yes, are competitive. They're extremely competitive, China. Yeah, yeah. Okay, real quick, some tips for effective sourcing. So again, I think culturally, China and India are very similar. So you've got to focus on relationships when you're sourcing from India. Build trust and relationships with your supplier. Go meet them. Uh, you know, make your payments on time. And once you build that relationship and trust, you will get better terms, priority treatment. Um, you also have to understand your product really well so that you come across as a serious buyer and work with your supplier as a partner. For example, don't push for uh, extremely low prices. You know, if you're if the pricing doesn't work out for you, then work with them 
to reduce prices in different ways. For example, use different materials in the product or change the you know functions and features of the product to to um, get the price that you want. And then little things like you know wish them on festivals or ask about their families and uh, you know build a relationship just as you would when you source from China. Also, hierarchy is important in India, so keep this in mind. Decisions are usually made at the highest level by the owner of the factory or you know senior managers that have the authority to make decisions. So I think, again, very similar to China. Um, if you want to negotiate price or talk about delivery times, it's best to talk to the owner or the boss of the factory for you know important decisions such as this. When you're talking to people and face-to-face -face introductions are done, um, you know, according to rank or according to age. So the the senior most person is introduced first, uh, you know, whether they're the eldest or they are the highest in rank. And then the concept of losing face, if people are familiar with this concept, you know, um, it's very prevalent in China and it's also prevalent in India. So you've got to just be a bit respectful and um uh, you know, when, when you're talking to a group of people and don't talk down to, let's say, the boss in front of uh, their subordinates. Yeah, this all goes back to, in fact, I'm going to go back two slides. This yeah. this is common sense. I mean, guys, this exactly. is business. And and what I've noticed is, you know, when you give, they give too. So uh, things like don't negotiate excessively low for a price. Look, if you're going to be a pain in the butt, they're not going to deal with you. And honestly, we need suppliers probably more than they need us, right? So we have to have these good relationships. Um, this is another one I see all the time. Understand your products you come across as serious. What happens all the time is I see people, especially when we were doing a lot of sourcing in China, people would reach out with these just kind of half-brained requests, and we try to pass those on. And the suppliers aren't taking it seriously because, you know, they have – bigger fish to fry. They have better customers that at least know what they're talking about. They didn't take it seriously at all, which is no good. Um, and then uh, be respectful. I mean, that's just common sense. Uh, talk to the owner for important decisions. That's all pretty common sense. I'm looking at a, a comment Tiffany just made. She said, I've received a quote from an India company, not purchased yet. She said, I was highly impressed with the ease of communication and apparently was speaking directly with the owner who insisted on calling me back on one of their holidays. That's awesome. And, you know, I think that one thing about India is they're eager to work. Like they're easy to start getting business. They're, you know, China, they don't really care as much because they're so loaded up and they're so busy. And I think that's why, you know, the Indian suppliers that we've dealt with were willing to give us lower MOQs. You know, they're willing to have the boss call you on the holiday. I mean, they're open for business. They're ready to go. They're just waiting on us to show up and get business done. So it's a really cool opportunity. Correct. And another thing you'll find similar to China is that sometimes suppliers don't say no. <laughs> so, uh, for example, which can be a problem. <laughs> it can be a problem. Yeah. So, um, you know, just be aware of that and make sure that uh, you know you're you're asking very specific questions. For example, if you uh, ask a supplier that you know specializes in. Uh, a certain product type, if you ask them if they make a different product ca category, they'll usually say, yeah, we can source that for you or we can make it for you or we can offer that product to you. And then they will go outsource it or, you know, get it from another factory. So if you really want to source from a factory, then make sure that, um, you know, the company that you're dealing with has the production facilities to manufacture that product. And you can ask specific questions like, okay, what are the machines that you have? You know, what are the production, what's the production capacity? What's the in-house production capacity? And be very specific and say that, hey, um, you know, be open about it and say, I don't want to source from, uh, you know, another factory. If, if you make that product in-house, just let me know. If not, then that's fine. So, um, yeah, don't ask questions that have, you know, a yes or no answer. Sometimes it's uh, difficult to... Um, you know, determine if they are actually giving you accurate information. <laughs> That's the challenge, actually. And it, it, it's the same in China, too. Yeah. But I feel that in India, they're a bit more transparent. Um, in China, you'll have things like they'll take you to a factory, but it's not really their own factory, but they'll say it's their own factory. It's their Man, factory. Man, I've got some stories but, about that. Yeah. But I haven't heard of that sort of stuff happening in India. So another thing to keep in mind is when you're sourcing from India, you've got to make sure that the supplier is export focused. So there's a huge difference between suppliers that cater to the domestic market and suppliers that export. 
India is a huge country. There's a lot of demand for products domestically. So there are tons and tons of manufacturers that actually manufacture for the local market. But you want to stay away from them because they are not familiar with quality standards or certifications or requirements of import markets. And that's the reason I like this trade show that we're going to in India um, in October because it's export focused. All of the 3,000 suppliers over there are um, you know, export ready and export focused. Uh, did we skip this? Okay, how to start sourcing from India. So uh, in case you're interested, um, you know, first the first thing that you should do is search for suppliers on the major supplier directories, Alibaba, Global Sources, and then there's a local supplier directory called India Mart. You can search for suppliers over there as well. Uh, but take note that Alibaba and Global Sources have more export-focused suppliers. And what you can do is on these websites, do a, after you do a product search, use the supplier location filter to search for India suppliers. India Mart is a local supplier directory, but there are also a lot of domestic focus suppliers there. So you have to vet suppliers a little more carefully on this website. And there are some sourcing agents that you can uh, contact. These are vetted sourcing agents that are coaches on the India sourcing trip that we're doing in October. And um, you know, for inspections, there's Kima. So this is a global company. They have uh, a lot, many offices in India as well, and uh, they do pre pre shipment inspections, um, product testing, factory audits. You know, all of the usual services. And then for logistics, I've got this company called uh, Sea Air Online, and uh, they are very familiar with FBA requirements. They, in, in fact, even have a partner warehouse in the U.S. So they can send your products or send your shipment to the U.S. and then split the shipment over there to send it to different uh, warehouses. And that's huge. And um, Megla, if it's all right with you, I'm going to email these slides to everybody that registered for this webinar. Is that okay with you? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Because I feel like, you know, a lot of you are – probably taking notes right now, you know, for these email addresses like this, this is gold information. I've got some of my own contacts that we're using currently on this slide right here. This is stuff that all of you viewers need to have. So I'm going to literally email this to you um, tomorrow, tw whatever your um, time zone is in uh, 12 hours from now or so. I'll email <laughs> you the, you guys that this information, at least with the contact information, because this is hugely, hugely important. And here are some resources. So I've written uh, an ebook on how to source from India. So that will give you an overview of, uh, you know, different aspects like products to source, quality control, pricing. So just head over to indiasourcingtrip.com forward slash ebook. It's a free book. All you need to do is uh, enter your email address. And then if uh, I've also started a Facebook group for people who are interested in sourcing from India. So feel free to join that group. Um, real quick, I have a couple of slides on the India sourcing trip in case anyone's interested. So this is a learning plus sourcing plus cultural guided tour to the Indian Handicrafts and Gifts Fair in Delhi. As I mentioned earlier, this is an export focused fair that has about 3000 exhibitors and the trip dates are October 14th to the 20th. So These let me ask you a question. Kimberly just asked a question. Is this fair that we're going to going on at the same time as Canton Fair? So... I think it's there's a little bit of overlap. Before phase two, yeah, n no, it's before phase two of Canton Fair. So it's in a so gap right there. It's it's a gap, yeah. So the the dates for this fair, I mean, the trip is six, 14 to the twentieth, and then Canton Fair phase two, I think, is twenty third to the twenty seventh, yeah, or something like so, that. So so yeah. long story short, Kimberly, don't worry about going to Canton Fair. You're coming to China next month. We'll uh, knock China out and then come with us in uh, October to India. That way you can do both. Solves that. <laughs> yeah, and then here are some of the product categories that you'll be able to find at the fair. And, you know, these are the categories that are mentioned um, previously. So most of the categories that India is, is uh, competitive in, you know, home decor, furnishings, all of those things, eco-friendly products. Um, why attend the trip? So you'll you'll have access to a lot of innovative products from India that other Amazon sellers don't have access to. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the barrier to entry is a bit higher. And uh, apart from attending the fair, I'm also organizing uh, a conference on um, you know how to source from India. So before we attend the fair, there's a full day of presentations 
And I've got a, a, a group of India sourcing experts who are going to be talking about various topics related to sourcing from India. So like pitfalls to avoid, how to find suppliers, how to vet suppliers, negotiating, logistics, quality control. So it's almost like a crash course in sourcing from India. And then, you know, just have fun with like-minded supplier uh, sellers. I think that's um, one of the biggest advantages of traveling in groups like this. You can, you spend so many days with, um, you know, other sellers and get with to learn so much from them. Better. That's what it's all exactly. about is, is, you know, you're only as totally. good as the people that you're around. And man, those hardcore um, trips, Megla came on one of our spring trips to China and just like the relationships that you make on those are, are second to none. It's fantastic. Exactly. And then you'll also get to experience India's culture and um, visit the Taj Mahal. So I've organized a one day trip to the Taj Mahal, which is uh, one of the seven wonders of the world. It's in a city called Agra. That's about 300 kilometers uh, or about three hours by road from Delhi. So we'll leave early in the morning and be back late at night. And I've also organized a cultural program, a dance program for the group. So we've booked uh, a, a room in a hotel and we've got a stage and lights and a DJ and it's, it's an exclusive dance show for our group. So that's going to be a lot oh, of fun. So it's a show. You're not going to let me dance for everybody. You can totally. I mean, <laughs> I would I'm love just to saying, and if you want to see some entertainment, <laughs> you're going to want to see me dance. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna do a Facebook live of you dancing at that show. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. That, that video is gonna go viral. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so here are some of the coaches who are joining the trip. Um, there are some, um, you know, people from Australia. Um, Margaret actually has been sourcing from India for about one and a half years now, and she's very successful. She's in fact going to meet her supplier in India before she joins us for the trip. And uh, she started with, um, you know, sourcing from China a couple of years ago. And then she has she has now stopped her China products and she's only doing India products. And she is on her way to making a hundred thousand dollars in profit per year sourcing from india i think most people talk about revenue and sales in e-commerce but don't matter. not a lot of people talk about yep. profit so i was really happy to hear you know margaret talking about her profits <laughs> and uh, chris thomas he's also from australia great guy very helpful cj he's going to be talking a lot about brand building and of course who's this guy here who's this bearded guy here <laughs> it's an ugly indian dancer <laughs> Yeah, Tim, I'm so excited that you're coming on this trip and uh, you're going to be providing a lot of value to attendees. Um, I've got a lot of India experts. So this is a, a, um, a sourcing agent who's been in the industry for 25 years. She worked for Lee and Fung as their uh, vice president for India sourcing. She, she's got a ton of experience. Um, uh, these two people here are from BHI Imports, which is uh, basically a sourcing agent and they're Americans who are living in India. So this is Aaron. He's actually currently living in India. That's Mark. <laughs> he used to live in India. Mark used to live in India. He's, he's, oh, did I circle uh, the wrong the one? Now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I got to quit playing with the whiteboard. <laughs> but Mark has a lot of, um, uh, he used to, he, he lived in India for about four years, um, I think a couple of years ago, and he's going to be talking about cultural sensitivities when sourcing from India. And Aaron, of course, he currently lives in India. So he has a very unique perspective, you know, being an American and living in India. And then this is the logistics person, Samiksha. Um, Varun, he's one of the, you know, e-commerce experts sourcing. This is a manufacturer. So this last guy over here, he's actually a garment manufacturer from South India. So I invited him to, you know, talk to us about how the, textile and garment industries are structured and, and what's going on in, in that industry in, in South India. So those are the coaches. Oops, I think we missed a slide. We're both clicking at the same time. I think so. <laughs> All right, you click it. Okay. Okay, got it. There we go. So if you want more information, uh, head over to indiasourcingtrip.com. Send me an email at info at indiasourcingtrip.com or just, um, you know, send me a message on Facebook and uh, let me know if you're interested to join the trip. It's going to be an epic trip. <laughs> epic. All right. So epic. I'm going to send everybody those, um, some of those questions, or I'm sorry, some of those slides with information like the contact information. I want to start hammering out some of these questions. So I've got three or four questions that I have we have not addressed yet, which means that you all have time to post any questions that you might have in the chat. 
Um, I'm going to go back a few questions. Peter was asking, he said, if you're going to India, essentially, you know, are there cultural sensitivities that we need to be aware of? Any special, special business etiquette? Like in China, I learned it really impressed everybody when you hand a business card with two hands, you know, but, but also things that we would avoid that would be, um, you know, rude. So he's like saying, if a woman goes to India alone, can she get meetings with uh, the boss? Um, can a Western guy shake a woman's hand or should he refrain from doing that? You know, so give us like a few of the top highlights so we don't look like complete idiots when we go over there. <laughs> so I think, um, yeah, that's one thing, you know, if, if, uh, if you're being introduced to a group of people and there, there's a woman in there, then don't extend your hand to shake her hand unless she does so. Because India is a country of contrasts. You'll find that there are people who are educated in the U.S. and, you know, they're really um, westernized and they're exposed to Western culture and they have no hiccups about, you know, shaking hands with guys or anything like that. But at the same time, there are also a lot of people who are very traditional and they, they uh, you know, they don't want to do all of that. And so you, you just got to be a bit cautious about that. When you're meeting a woman, then don't extend your hand to shake Unless she does it first, <laughs> right? Um, Let the woman control things. Yeah, exactly. Life is always smoother when you do that. I'm <laughs> yeah, I've been married long enough. Everywhere, to learn right? That. Not only in India. That's true everywhere. <laughs> um, all right, I'm reading through this. Guys, post your questions yeah. if you have any. Um, oh, Alan, Alan, I see Alan is here. Yeah, Alan is from for Singapore. Your time. He's going to be joining us on the India yes. trip as well as Global Sources. Yes. Summit and going to Canton Fair. That's going to be a busy month. Yeah. Um, and Bryant asks a great question here, and I'm going to hammer this one. He said, if we're scaling quickly, doesn't it make sense to source from China first since it's more of a scalable country than if product successful, then look at other countries? All right. That's That could be answered a lot of different ways because there's a lot of different ways to, to answer that, right? Um, what I mean is there are a lot of products in India that can be scaled quickly. Right. The products that we are currently scaling from India could absolutely go very fast. Um, there's no problem with that. There's not a scalability issue. One thing that I have found to be one of the biggest problems with Amazon private label sellers or private label sellers in general is picking that product. Right. Like we all want to um, find that product that scales up really fast for us, um, you know, especially when we're getting started or new new product. The problem that I found is it's hard to find those products without testing. Right. So, yeah, China might be able to scale faster, but their MOQs are much larger. So in India, we can find these products that may be a little bit less saturated, less sales history on a platform like Amazon. But maybe they're blowing up on Pinterest and we're going, ah, we think they'll work. We're not 100 percent sure. So, yeah, we could scale a lot faster in China, potentially, if we know it's going to scale. The problem is I don't want to buy 3000 or 2000 of something if I don't know it's going to sell. So typically we like those lower MOQs. So for us. Scaling is not about finding one product that can go really, really big, really, really fast. Scaling for us is about finding 10 products for the same budget that we can start with and get rolling. And all 10 of those products kind of fly under the radar, like they, they stay less competitive. So we scale wide, but not deep. What we've found is that the products that we do select that unexpectedly go a lot deeper or a lot higher than we thought they would, those are the products that are usually going to become saturated, meaning the price is going to tank later or more people are going to attack our listing or attack us as sellers. So those are less ideal. It's easier for us to go wide instead of deep. And a place like India, we have found uh, really fits that, that business model. But I, I, to be honest, have not seen a situation where uh, a supplier we've used in India could not handle the growth demands that we required of them. Um, and I'm sure India, you can, or uh, India, Megla, I'm sure you could uh, vouch for that or, or maybe clarify or even argue with me. I mean, opinions no, are No, I agree so with you. you got. Um, yeah, I totally agree with you. I think, um, you know, it's important to find the right supplier in India. That's going to be uh, very critical. And, and there are suppliers that have large capacity. And it's also very easy for them to expand because, you know, for products that are handcrafted, they can... Um, you know, just I'll bring in more production. people. I'll bring in more yeah, people. Exactly. They don't, they don't exactly. have to have more equipment. They don't have to have more Correct. floor space in that manufacturing facility. They can exactly. literally just bring in more people for a big order, and there's not a lot of capital investment on their part. So, Correct. yeah, that completely makes sense. They could scale actually more quickly than a place like China for yeah. the factory or manufacturer's production capabilities. Correct. Awesome. All right. Any other questions? 
If not, we're just going to have to leave. Got nothing else to talk about. <laughs> um, while you guys are, are thinking about um, any other questions you have, let me say this. Diversify everything that you do. All right. Um, I, we still f focus a lot in China, like we've talked about, but we're also sourcing in Central America. We're looking at some other places. We're sourcing in China or uh, in India. Um, and, you know, obviously investing a lot of our own time and effort and energy in expanding that by going in October to, you know, even more importantly than seeing all these thousands and thousands and thousands of products and, and meeting suppliers. I'm sorry, not meeting suppliers, but, but, um, you know, seeing these vendors, it's the relationships that we're going to build, right? So the people on the trip, the leaders, um, everything like that's the most important thing. People that have been coming for years on our China sourcing trips, that's the most valuable thing they get out of it. Now they can afford to come because they usually find products instantly that they can sell. They can make their money. It's great. Um, generally, not always. There's a few, few folks that, uh, struggle a little bit, you know, just hundred percent transparency. Not everybody succeeds, but for the most part, the relationships are the most valuable part. And if you don't get off your butt and you don't do something bold, um, and go out and shake those hands, whether it's a local conference, a local meetup. Um, I'm going to be speaking in Singapore next month at a local meetup, um, which is, you know, like super easy for Singaporeans to come to um, all the way to going, you know, across the world on a sourcing trip somewhere that's cool and get to see the Taj Mahal and watch me belly dance. You know, like whatever you're doing, you got to get off your butt. You got to shake some hands. You got to meet some people. Um, Next month, we're doing our event in, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, not next month, next week, the end of next week in Vegas, we're doing this ASD trade show walkthrough and uh, our networking day there. And like, we're going to find a lot of cool products. We're going to teach a lot of cool stuff, but there's going to be relationships that happen in that conference room and in our meetup spots. They're going to be way more valuable than even the content we teach. And you can't get that, you know, through just a Facebook group. So I would challenge all of you, whatever you're doing, keep learning, keep listening, um, use some humility. You know, and understand that, and, and I try to do it too. You know, I don't know it all. I have to learn from people. That's why, you know, I love meeting people like Megla and, and learning from, from her, learning from my experiences, learning from other people's mistakes are so important. Um, never been a better time to be an entrepreneur. Never been a better time to get into e-commerce right now. It's not saturated. It's not done. We're just at the very beginning. Uh, just keep pushing. Um, sorry, that was my soapbox there for a minute. <laughs> I mean, talking about diversifying, you know, uh, Amazon is not the only marketplace, right? Etsy, I think people should start exploring Etsy as well. And then India offers a lot of great products that you could actually sell on Etsy really well. And in fact, a lot of products are already being sold on Etsy. And, you know, on Etsy, you don't have to make the products yourself. You can actually design the products and then get them manufactured by somebody else. So, you know, that's something else to consider. Yeah. Um Let's see. Alan says, I look forward to meeting you in Singapore. <laughs> yes. I'll be there. We were just talking about getting a, a nice catered dinner. She said this month the meetup is just going to be pizza and beer, but next <laughs> month she's going to make it fancy since she knows I'm a fatty and I like to eat. Um, <laughs> Spencer asked, what's the link again for the trip? I believe it's just IndiaSourcingTrip.com. That's right. You're so like, like so far advanced on this whole concept that you got the greatest domain ever for India sourcing trips, <laughs> India sourcing exactly. trip .com. Um, Kimberly Solomon, do you need a VPN? No, you, there, no. there's nothing like government blocks, nothing like that in India. Um, uh, the, the, the Jason, I hear that selling on Amazon India is different is people can return the product. Yes, they can return it. And I yeah. think there's cash on delivery, right? Yes. So it's a little bit more complicated <laughs> and they actually have a lot of uh, customer service involved in the listings. Right. So people through the listings can actually contact service reps. So it's different, but there's a billion people in India and it's got a faster growing middle class even than China is my understanding. So I yes. think that if we're not learning about India and meeting Indian people and um, becoming familiar with that, I think that we're missing out on a big future opportunity. And Brian, mobile he's... commerce is growing. That's what's growing. Mobile e-commerce. That's growing really fast in India because people don't have access to computers or Wi-Fi, but they have cheap phones and, you know, 3G connectivity yeah. or 4G so or whatever. So Bryant says, thanks for answering, but, which basically translates to, Tim, you did not answer my question. Let me try again. <laughs> so let me try again. Um, he says, what I mean, so an example is he wants to produce a garlic press sourcing service to find a supplier that's capable of producing quality product fast with customization and everything. It's quicker turnover to find a legit supplier than sell. But if we visit other countries like India, it takes longer and not scalable because we have to physically go to the country unless there's some sourcing services in India. 
Um, Hickory Flats and is a question mark. No, Hickory Flats, we're not do, uh, offering sourcing services in India. I'm just here to teach you guys this stuff. This isn't my trip. This is Megla's trip. I'm literally just trying to share uh, content with you guys. So if you go back to those slides and I'll send this contact information in the email that I follow up tomorrow, it's nine o'clock here and I'm pretty tired. So I probably won't get to it tonight. Uh, we'll have some sourcing agents. Um, and yes, you're right, Brian. It would take longer to find a supplier in India for something like a garlic press. But I would say that a garlic press, you know, source that in China, right? So if we're exactly. looking in India correctly, if we're using India what it's best used for, it might take a little bit longer, but it's going to be the best place to do it. And anything worth doing right is worth waiting for. I strongly believe that. Um, I'll give you an example. We've got some leather products that uh, we've gone through a couple rounds of prototypes and we're now in full production on that going back and forth with the prototypes from India was a little bit slower. It was. I could have probably done it in three weeks through China. It took me about six weeks through India. But we've got a much better product with barriers to entry. We're not going to have other people jumping on the listing. You know, so you, it's kind of a give and take. It's kind of a trade. Um, and for us, with some products, it's worth it. Now, there are other products that we're just going to continue sourcing and having manufactured in China. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. But, um, you know, as we diversify, there will be things that are better applicable for India. Now, the products that it took us longer to source and gain those relationships to get the prototypes, if they want to scale up faster for production, no problem. So it's only a little bit more work on the front end, but I think the back end benefits and rewards are very, very valuable and, and kind of worth that hassle as compared to China on the front end. And if we're not having to worry about, you know, duties and stuff like that, then still super, super valuable. So again, you know, we did a lot of comparisons between China and India, and, and I appreciate Megla being kind of upfront and honest about the pros and the cons of India. There's there's this great balance, and I think that it's kind of a case by case situation, a product by product situation. So, Brian, what I would do is when you uh, get those contact information of those sourcing agents, use them, like use them just for information. You don't necessarily have to have to source through them, but just ask them what they think, and I'm sure that they'll give you good advice, good information on at least their opinions of what type of products you could potentially be looking at would be better from India or better from China. Oh man, Alan just invited me to golf in Singapore at the Singapore Ooh. Cricket Club. Alan, oh, I'll be yeah, honest you with you. That. That's really good. So, <laughs> Alan, I took um, I took golf lessons about four years ago from a pro, and I've never played a game of golf. <laughs> so, you do not want me playing golf. But hey, I always look for a free meal, so I'm going to be there um, for I think uh, a day doing some sightseeing and stuff before the workshop that Friday. So, yeah, hit me up on Facebook. We'll connect, and I'll let you take me out to lunch for sure. Yeah, Alan and I met up for lunch at Singapore Cricket Club recently, last week, in fact. So, yeah, the food's really good there. Nice environment. <laughs> well, it's all about stories for me. So when I'm old yeah. and decrepit, I can say, that day I was in the Singapore Cricket Club <laughs> eating lunch and, you know, make it sound way cooler than it really was to my <laughs> great-great-grandchildren. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Um, well, if you guys have any other questions, we're going to wrap this thing up, but you know how to track us down. You can find me on Facebook. You can find Megla on Facebook. Track either of us down. We'll be answered to ha happy to answer any questions. If any of you are interested in coming to India with us, um, again, this is not my trip. I'm not, I'm not selling this for me. I, I feel so strongly in it that both myself and my partner, JB Brown are going to India in October and we'd love to hang out with you. Um, I just wanted to share this information because I think so many of you need to understand more about India. I think there's great opportunities and tell you about this trip because there's still plenty of time to get involved in this. The flights, I think JB just booked a business class flight all the way to New Delhi for like $3,100. I'm seeing economy tickets for like a thousand. That's really, really cheap to go to India. So uh, if you guys are interested, you can ping me with any questions, more importantly, ping Megla. Um, and let us know what you thought about the content. Let us know if it was helpful for you. That's really encouraging to us. It kind of gives us the motivation to be uh, up early in the morning in Megla's situation or up late at night trying to put this stuff out for you guys. So really appreciate it. Um, thank you guys for the comments. And I guess we're going to sign off. And I will send you guys a follow-up email tomorrow. And we will see everybody else on Facebook land or wherever else we see you. And Alan, I'm definitely holding you accountable for lunch <laughs> in Singapore. All right, guys. Talk to you later. All right. Thank you very much. Bye.